Well, hello and welcome. I'm General Retired Mike Scaparotti, former commander of U.S. European Command and Supreme Allied Commander Europe. I'm also a director on the board of the Atlantic Council, and I'd like to welcome you today to the latest event in the Council's Defense Industrial Policy Series, the U.S.-Italian Defense Relationship, a strategic and industrial partnership. I'm pleased to welcome a variety of distinguished voices to our event today. In particular, we have a distinct honor of a keynote address from the Italian ambassador to the United States, Her Excellency Marangela Zappia, as well as introductory remarks from the Chief Executive Officer of Leonardo SPA, Mr. Alessandro Profumo. Introducing the ambassador is also Mr. William Lin, Chief Executive Officer of Leonardo DRS and a fellow board director here at the Atlantic Council. They will be followed by a panel discussion among defense industrial and transatlantic experts, including Mr. Ermi Ike Blanton from the Department of Defense, Ms. Lauren Speranza from the Center for European Policy Analysis, and Dr. James Hasek and Ms. Leah Scheneman from the Atlantic Council. I'd like to thank these speakers for joining us and our audience for tuning in virtually. Here at the Atlantic Council, our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States, its allies, and its partners. The center seeks to honor the late General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embodies his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. Consistent to, with that mission, the Scowcroft Center's Ford Defense Practice and Transatlantic Security Initiative shaped the debate around the greatest security and defense challenges facing the United States and its allies. One of our greatest geopolitical challenges is the return of great power competition with China and Russia. As we confront these competitors, close cooperation between the United States and its European allies remains essential. Italy in particular hosts one of the largest deployments of American troops in Europe, while Italian defense firms are deeply integrated into U.S. supply chains and into U.S. defense industrial base. Italy is also one of the key members of NATO. I know this well from my time as the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe, during which Italy consistently bolstered the capabilities of the alliance across the European region and beyond, often as a framework nation in NATO missions. During my career, I spent considerable time in Vicenza, Italy, in command of the 3rd Battalion, 325th Airborne Combat Team, and I'm deeply familiar with the imperatives of close collaboration and interoperability with our Italian allies. I know personally the warm welcome and support that Italy provides for our service members and their families stationed there. Also, my grandparents immigrated from Italy to America in the early 1900s, and I've been blessed to know my family in Italy and stay in contact with them throughout my adult life, developing an insight and love for the culture and people of Italy. As the United States shifts its defense posture to address near-peer competition and combat a variety of emerging threats around the world, political, military, and industrial cooperation with Italy will continue to be a major contributor to U.S. and NATO security. In that spirit, this event also marks the release of a new Atlantic Council issue brief, Una Squadra Vincente, the U.S.-Italian Defense Industrial Partnership, which explores the strategic significance of this partnership for the industrial preparedness of the United States and the effectiveness of the, Atlantic, uh, of the North Atlantic Alliance generally. But we are excited for this discussion today. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker. We are very fortunate to be joined today by Mr. Alessandro Profumo, the Chief Executive Officer of Leonardo SPA. Mr. Profumo has a long and distinguished career in aerospace and defense sector, as well as the banking and finance sector. He is also the President of the Aerospace and Defense Industries Association of Europe, and the Honorary Chairman of the Italian Industries Federation for Aerospace, Defense and Security. On behalf of the Atlantic Council, I'd like to thank Leonardo and Mr. Profumo for their continued support of the council in this project. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mr. Profumo for his remarks. Thank you. Thank you, General Scaparotti, for your service to the defense of the United States and Europe uh, and for the kind uh, introduction you gave to me. 
Welcome, Ambassador Zappia, dear Mariangela, and congratulations on your appointment over, over the summer. <clears throat> and thank you to the Atlantic Council for increasing the focus on the critical and mutually beneficial ties between the United States and the European allies. These ties remain the bedrock not only for, the tra for transatlantic, but global security and international trade as well. You will be comforted to know that while America recently reflected on the summer events of September 11th, your friends in the Italian Republic shared your grief as well as your strong determination to make the world a safer place. I'm proud to say that the armed forces of Italy stood shoulder to shoulder with their American counterparts in Iraq and Afghanistan across the following two decades and through allies, as true allies. The strong ties between our two nations run along the front lines of freedom around the world and extended across the assembly lines of factories and laboratories in the United States and Italy as well. As president of the Aerospace and Defense Industries Association of Europe, as well as a CEO of Leonardo, I am deeply proud of the industrial ties we share. For example, Leonardo builds a F-35 in Italy for our European partners in the large, largest fighter air aircraft program in the world, provides the power and propulsion technology for the top US military modernization priority, the Kulungla class submarine, along with helicopters and training system for the Navy and the Air Force and force protection, network computing and advanced sensor technology for the ground forces. In fact, most of the major American and Italian aerospace and defense companies have business interest in one and other country, which reflects enduring strengths of the defense industrial partnership between Italy and the United States. However, while our, ours is a productive and beneficial relationship, we can always improve. Industry can continue to do its part by establishing business-to-business -business partnership teaming arrangements and joint ventures. Our governments can do their part by recognizing our historical, historic collaboration while creating a framework of policy guidelines and the regulatory environment that encourages deeper engagement. In a broader perspective, the debate underway in Europe for building an integrated defense goes in the direction of further strengthening transatlantic relations. I firmly believe that a stronger Europe can certainly make NATO stronger as well. This is what our discussion and the report made public today is all about making an already great relationship even better. After all, allies by definition are always stronger together. Thank you for having me today and thank you once again to the Atlantic Council for this insightful report. Now I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Bill Lynn. Bill, the floor, the floor is yours. Th thank you, Alessandro, and thanks for those insightful remarks. I couldn't agree with you more that the industrial relations between the United States and Italy are, are more important than ever to our, our collective defense and our mutual security. And then we can build on the goodwill and the robust foundation already established by industry and our two governments especially in a world where both nation state and rogue state actors threaten our collective security, deepening the ties between two strong allies is an imperative, both in our factories and among the armed forces. Few individuals are more qualified to speak about the depth of our industrial and defense ties than our next speaker. Ambassador Zapia has served in a number of strategic positions that have provided her with invaluable insight concerning our discussion today. She's a career dis diplomat with more than 35 years of experience. She was the permanent representative of Italy to the United Nations in New York, and before that to NATO. She was the diplomatic advisor to the Italian prime minister and to the G7 and G20. And she served as the Council General of Italy in New York City. Today, she marks a historic first for our two nations. She's the first woman to hold her current position as the Italian ambassador to the United States of America. We very much look forward to hearing her thoughts today on the subject 
of immense importance to all of us who care about the historic and value-based relationship between the United States and Italy. We are fortunate to benefit from her ideas so early in her tenure here in the U.S. as she was appointed only this past summer. Please welcome Ambassador Mariangela Zappia, Italian Ambassador to the United States. Thank you, Bill, for your kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to open this event on the strategic U.S.-Italian defense relationship. I thank the Atlantic Council, the organizers, and all speakers and participants. A special thank to General Scaparotti for his welcome, to Alessandro Profumo, and to the authors of the very interesting research that we are presenting today, Mauro Gilli and James Hasek. This webinar is particularly timely and fits very well into the ongoing debate on the future of transatlantic relations. We all followed very closely the withdrawal from Afghanistan and more recently the announcement of the Pacific Partnership between the US, the UK and Australia. Two decisions of great importance that raised some concern, bringing into the spotlight the issues of coordination between the two sides of the Atlantic and of the strategic autonomy of the European Union. I believe we should take advantage of this juncture to refocus on how we can further strengthen the transatlantic alliance, which remains a non-replaceable pillar of our foreign policy. As our foreign minister Luigi Di Maio said, there is no plan B to the transatlantic relationship. Europe continues to play a crucial role for security, both towards Russia and the growing penetration of China. At the same time, Europe is America's main partner when it comes to many aspects. Values, protection of human rights and support to democracy, economy and trade. Together, the EU and the US are the largest market in the world. Climate, cooperation in the G20 and the COP26. And technology, development of common standards, creation of resilient infrastructures and collaboration in cybersecurity. The US is actively engaged to re-establish a climate of trust with Paris, as well as with the European Union, as we saw last week in the meeting in Pittsburgh of the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. My point is that the clarification sparked by the so-called submarine crisis can actually represent an opportunity. In fact, never before in such clear terms, the US is underlying the importance of a stronger and more capable European defense that contributes positively to the transatlantic and global security and is complementary to NATO. This is a position that Italy fully shares. We believe that a stronger European defense helps strengthen the European pillar of the transatlantic alliance. This is how we interpret the idea of EU strategic autonomy. This renewed debate on the relationship between the United States and Europe can find an important evidence in the defense sector, and the Italian experience proves that well. Italy has always chosen Atlanticism in its defense industry relations. Over the last 30 years, Italian companies have come to play a greater role in U.S. defense acquisitions, and Italy has proven to be an extremely reliable partner for the American defense supply chain in a broad range of sectors, from electronics with Leonardo DRS to helicopters with Leonardo Helicopters, from ships with Fincantieri to space with Thales Salenia Space Italia. Let me recall that Leonardo and Fincantieri are among the largest military suppliers in the world. The privileged relationship between our two countries has allowed Italy to access a very advanced market and to shine as a trusted partner in the industrial field. On the other end, major US groups such as Lockheed Martin and Boeing successfully invested in Italy. Let me highlight just a few examples of, of this great cooperation well described in the report that you will read today. First, the F-35 Next Generation Aircraft Program testifies to the strong collaboration between Lockheed Martin and Leonardo. In fact, Italy is one of only two countries outside the US to host the production site for this program. Second, the unique supply of solutions through Leonardo DRS and Leonardo helicopters to the US Armed Forces. Third, the design and supply by Fincantieri to the US Navy of the new Constellation class multi-role missile frigates after a long collaboration with Lockheed Martin for the littoral combat ship. I would also like to draw your attention on some figures which underline the economic importance of the defense industry in our respective countries. In Italy, before the pandemic, the sector generated 13.5 billion euros in value, 
equal to approximately 0.65% of GDP and 15% of the total European value, employing approximately 160,000 people. In the US, the sector is one of the driving forces of the economy. The significant Italian contribution can count first and foremost on companies such as Leonardo and Fincantieri, with the engagement of over 10,000 employees overall. Finally, yet importantly, let me recall that the US-Italian Defense Partnership encompasses space as well. Born with the San Marco project in the 60s, the partnership was continued over time, providing support to International Space Station through the supply of pressurized modules, including today through Cygnus fueling modules. We are collaborating in the new space economy in different ways. Personnel from the Italian Air Force and the National Research Center, CNR, will fly aboard Virgin Galactic to conduct scientific experiments. Satellites will be launched with SpaceX and other projects are underway. Let me conclude by going back to where we started, Atlanticism. In his recent meeting at the Pentagon with Minister of Defense Lorenzo Guerrini, Secretary Austin referred to Italy as an ideal partner and an exporter of security. Whether it is to fight terrorism in the Sahel or to bring peace and stabilization to the areas of conflict, Italy is ready to give its contribution. Here in the United States, there is a genuine admiration for our military, as recently confirmed by the extraordinary cooperation in the evacuation operation from Kabul. Even after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, our engagement within NATO and our military cooperation with the, with the US armed forces continues in Kosovo and Iraq, where next year we will simultaneously ensure the command of the K-4 and NMI missions. Italy stands strong in promoting an even greater cooperation between our defense and security industries, including through a role of government approach, which is essential both to achieving this task and to countering mounting competition by emerging countries. Ladies and gentlemen, cari amici, thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you, Ambassador Zapia, for recording these timely remarks addressing the importance of the moment for transatlantic relations and the privileged relationship between Italy and the United States. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Leah Schuneman and I am the Deputy Director of the Transatlantic Security Initiative here at the Atlantic Council Scowcross Center for Strategy and Security. I'm very excited to kick off this panel discussion on the U.S.-Italian defense relationship. Today, we are joined by an exciting lineup of panelists on the Atlantic Council's virtual stage. First, I would like to introduce Mr. Ermi Ike Blanton from the U.S. Department of Defense. Mr. Blanton is Deputy Director for the International and Strategic Engagement in the Office of the Foreign Investment Review, which is the Department of Defense's lead office for the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS for those in the know. He works on the Pentagon's international, congressional, and domestic engagements on CFIUS, and on other foreign investment review issues. Prior to joining DOD, Ike was a foreign service officer at the Department of State. We are also joined by Dr. James, James Hasek, a non-resident senior fellow at the Scowcroft Center. Along with Dr. Mauro Gilli, he is the co-author of the issue brief we're launching with this event today, Una Squadra Vincente, the U.S.-Italian Defense Industrial Partnership. My colleague Christian Trotti has put the link to this paper in the chat. Over the past 16 years, Dr. Hasek has assisted defense contractors and defense ministries with their problems in defense and business strategy, planning, and policy analysis. Finally, we are very pleased to have Ms. Lauren Speranza with us for a conversation today. Ms. Speranza is the director of the Transatlantic Defense and Security at the Center for European Policy Analysis, or CEPA. She focuses on transatlantic relations, defense and deterrence in Europe, hybrid warfare, and NATO-European Union relations. Prior to joining SIPA, Lauren worked here at the Atlantic Council and was my predecessor as the Deputy Director of the Transatlantic Security Initiative. So before we begin, I would like to remind our audience to ask questions through the panel discussion by using the Q&A tab, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to identify yourself and your affiliation in your questions. We will be collecting these questions throughout the event, and my colleague Steve Grenman will pose them to the panelists at the end. With that, I am very excited to begin this discussion. Lauren? I would like to begin with you. 
we, uh, as the council's former resident Italian aficionado, and I think the only person on the screen who's actually fluent in Italian, I was hoping you could frame the current strategic context for the bilateral U.S.-Italian security relationship within how you're seeing the overall transatlantic relationship right now. We have a new U.S. administration in place. Apparently, America is back. But what are some opportunities you see for Italy to play a larger role in transatlantic security and enhance its bilateral defense cooperation with the United States? Well, Leah, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be to be back with the Atlantic Council family and with so many friends and colleagues from Italy. Um, I'm, I'm so honored to join this panel with so many distinguished speakers and talking about a topic close to my own heart. So just to touch on some of the issues that you raised about the broader context around the bilateral U.S.-Italy relationship and the, and the transatlantic relationship, I think I would start by saying that although we are indeed in the Biden era of renewing alliances and partnerships, it's safe to say that transatlantic relations have started off a little bit rockier, I think, than many had hoped in this administration. The combination of the Nord Stream 2 decision, the fallout of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the AUKUS nuclear-powered submarine deal, for example, have caused some rifts. And overall, allied cohesion, I think, has suffered some blows. I think the transatlantic community finds itself in a tenuous moment with some uncertainty about the future, uncertainty about whether the U.S. really is back, as you said, um, about uh, the U.S. willingness to kind of fully consult and bring allies along, the U.S. role in Europe, giving the increasing focus on the Indo-Pacific and even future U.S. leadership beyond President Biden, as well as uncertainty about future European leadership. You know, we have Germany working to forge a government after its recent elections and Angela Merkel's departure as a former beacon of, of stability in Europe. And then we also have uncertainty about France's role, given its upcoming elections, its tense relations with the United States, and its growing ambitions for strategic autonomy, uh, which have proved in some ways divisive within Europe and the alliance. And against this backdrop, I think Italy in particular, as a major power, both within NATO and the EU, as we've heard, um, the third largest EU industrial power and a country with very strong bond to the United States has something of an opportunity here to sort of step into a more prominent leadership role and serve as a bit of a bridge for the U.S. into the EU, especially with the U.K. out due to Brexit. And the pro-European transatlantic oriented current government under Prime Minister Mario Draghi who is, is credited himself with sort of saving the Euro during the Eurozone crisis. And he's really dedicated to multilateralism. And I think he may just be uh, the right person to help Italy lean into this role and to make sure that Europe's link to the U.S. stays strong. And I think Italy is sort of uniquely suited, given some of its pragmatic relationships with, with even with Russia and China, to serve as a bit of a bridge between them and the West, um, even for some allies who favor softer approaches to Russia and China. The second thing I would say is that in the aftermath of Afghanistan, I think the alliance is going through some reflection and review regarding the future of its out-of-area operations and capacity-building activities, which have really long characterized NATO's projecting stability agenda, as we call it, towards the southern flank. Now, this set of issues, of course, has been hugely important to Italy, which sits in the heart of the southern flank. And as we've heard from the ambassador and others, Italy has really contributed to and led a lot of these activities. So I think this is another opportunity for Italy to think through in cooperation with the U.S. what these stabilization activities um, and the agenda for Europe South should look like going forward, especially because Italy and other southern allies have been working to bring more attention to this issue set and more resources to it for so long, but have really struggled to articulate a shared vision for the southern flank. So this could be a chance to reframe that debate a little bit, even as the focus moves to China and other things. And it's all the more important because allies are now developing NATO's next strategic concept too, which will impact the alliance's future core tasks and priorities. So Italy and the U.S. should absolutely be engaging here together. And third, I would just say there is a lot happening in the Mediterranean that elevates it as a critical region for transatlantic cooperation, especially between the U.S. and Italy. Naturally, the Med is a, a strategic conduit between Europe and the Middle East and Africa. It's a centerpiece of the transatlantic community for both geopolitical, economic, and security reasons. And the threat environment is in some ways, I would say, still characterized by the so-called arc of instability emanating from across the Med in the Middle East and Africa, where we're seeing things like failing states, weak governments and militaries, economic stagnation, poverty, violent conflicts in places like Syria and Libya. 
And this has given rise to terrorist groups. You know, we talk a lot about ISIS, Boko Haram, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah, who, which have not only led to attacks on European soil, but also produced a range of illicit flows, in, including the smuggling of weapons, goods, people to Europe, and this the, the refugee migration crisis that has gripped European and transatlantic policymakers. These challenges remain. They will be exacerbated in places like Africa in a few years' time, and they have implications well beyond Southern Europe. And we haven't managed to really get a transatlantic approach to these issues right. So I think there's more work for the U.S. and Italy to do there. But critically, I would say the Med is no longer just about projecting stability. It's also about great power competition and defense and deterrence. I mean, Russia is back in the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond in a big way. It has an increased military footprint, um, challenging anti-access area denial capabilities that could limit NATO's freedom of movement in the region. Moscow is engaging in provocative military maneuvers against ally and partner uh, planes and ships that have ratcheted up tensions and even engaged in military exercises with China in the region. Now, China also, for its part, has been increasing its influence through the Belt and Road Initiative and political frameworks, investing heavily in critical infrastructure, things like sensitive ports and telecoms networks inside Europe and the Mediterranean, uh, which could be manipulated for malign purposes and even jeopardize U.S. security engagement there. And China is also building up its military bases in Africa that could threaten transatlantic interests too. And while we're just starting to curb some of this and BRI has hit some snags, this could be another place for Italy to step up and start um, to kind of seize the American focus on China and work with the U.S. to push back on growing Chinese influence in this region inside the European theater. And we're already seeing some, some positive signs of that um, inside Italy. And again, this doesn't have to be military engagement in, in the Indo-Pacific for Italy. I'm talking about things like investment screenings and financial incentives and other kinds of political and security initiatives closer to home, where Italy could perhaps even bring other regional countries along. And just a few final words kind of on other dynamics that I think are worth noting. Iran is also just around the corner looking to exert influence in the wider region. Turkey, which was once a strategic anchor for the U.S. and the alliance in the region, has now become a kind of constraint on allied decision making, especially on regional issues due to its own kind of domestic political turbulence, drift from NATO shared values and kind of ad hoc cooperation with Moscow. Growing tensions between Greece and Turkey and Cyprus also exacerbate regional instability and kind of up the ante on all the competition that's going on over energy and gas resources, territorial claims and all the economic dimensions of that. So for all these reasons, I think it's just worth noting up top here, kind of the Mediterranean is a critical theater of operations for the United States and for the alliance to protect power, to deploy elsewhere, to maintain freedom of navigation and safe trade routes, and to secure the southern frontier of NATO. And Italy is our best partner for tackling so much of this in the Med, um, and really has more it can bring to the table with the U.S. looking ahead. And happy to talk a little bit more about exactly what that could look like in the discussion, but I hope that's useful to start us off. Yeah, thank you so much, Lauren, for the amazing strategic overview of the importance of the U.S.-Italy alliance and for so many proposals already on how to increase the strategic cooperation uh, across the spectrum of competition, but especially in the critical Mediterranean region. I think I will turn to Jim next. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for co-authoring the issue brief that we've launched today on U.S.-Italian defense industrial partnership. Can you tell us a little bit more about the paper and specifically what you think the key takeaways are for the public as well as the policy community on both sides of the Atlantic? Definitely. Very happy to do that. Um, I'm glad you say takeaways, uh, not just the outline. Um, I do think it's a very good paper and I would like to read it, um, but I want to give you the important things. I want to summarize what you should know if you don't have the time. Uh, I'm going to summarize that in three words. Uh, I got to say that my high school Italian doesn't hold up to Mauro's or even Lauren's, so bear with me. I'm, uh, I'm riffing a bit. Um, the first one that I think really describes this industrial, this military industrial relationship is, is qualità, quality in the products and services that we get in the United States from companies in Italy. My, my co-author Mauro likes to say that for, for many Americans, maybe for too many Americans, you know, you think about Italy and it's about wine and cheese. And maybe for me, it's about ties and shoes. But the U.S. military these days, it's about aircraft and ships and armored vehicles. It comes from some very big, as the ambassador was saying, as our sponsors uh, here have noted, from some very big, very trusted uh, global companies. 
uh, Leonardo and Fincantieri to begin with, but it also comes from lots of small firms that have been the backbone of Italian industry and Italian ingenuity for decades uh, since the Second World War. I dare say, I think Mauro would agree with me that there is there is some Italian genius for design that that translates even into well into armaments. And there's a serious focus in Italy on a manufacturing economy. It's a bigger sector per capita uh, than it is in the United States, in Italy. And there are sectors here in the United States that we worry about a great deal, like machine tools, which are really humming in this allied country. If we worry about these things, we ought to be building bridges and not worrying about, you know, uh, to, to, to sources of supply, not worrying so much about how we can reshore everything we possibly can. So that's the first word. The second word that comes to mind is mutualita, mutuality, because this is a relationship that has been evolving and strengthening over time. Now, through the late 1940s, the post-war era, through about 1985 or so, this was pretty much a one-way relationship with the material. It was substantially U.S. aircraft and missiles going to Italy to supply the Italian armed forces. And starting with the Beretta deal back in 1985, we saw progressively more imports into the United States, culminating in the big deal last year of the Navy's new frigate. That's going to be built in Wisconsin. It was largely designed in Italy. And it won against a lineup of some against, frankly, in a competition against some very capable ship designers and shipyards. We've also now been seeing for some time direct investment, foreign direct investment, and not just in those shipyards on the Great Lakes. And this means a great many Italian products now being built in the United States by Americans. This is a natural consequence of the policy preference and to a certain extent the legal requirements for domestic manufacturing, but people should be happy about that. Money flowing in here for American jobs. Also, I think important to note, and this is what something that John Scaparotti was noting earlier, that Italy is NATO's second busiest member, at least by the metric of who is going out outside of area to do things on behalf of the alliance. About one soldier, sailor, or airman, Italian, that is, in 20, is on overseas duty at any given time. And this means that there's a similar mindset, you know, in the American and Italian mil militaries about, about getting out and going. We design and we build for similar requirements. Now, this means there's an Italian military that has a lot of troops available. It's almost as large as the, about as size, same size as that of the United Kingdom, despite some serious demographic difficulty in Italy over time. However, Spending has been rather less, and this is a consequence of financial difficulties that are late, again, over time. However, for Americans, there's actually a bit of a silver lining to that. And that gets to me to my third word, which is fiducia, trust, a confidence that we can have in the durability and security of this relationship and in the security of the supply, even in times of crisis. And I think this is what Mauro and I meant by the squadra di gente, the winning team. There's a personal and a professional component to it, I think, as it is with, as is with many winning teams. There's an aspect of family ties between our countries, okay? Mauro is a very seriously pro-American Italian. I will say that my own maternal grandmother came here, you know, as, as General Scaparotti was saying about his family, my own maternal grandmother came here from the, to the U.S. from Italy in 1927. It was a tough time politically in Italy. I'm grateful to Italy for sending her. I'm grateful to America for making, you know, for offering her a home. I think also, however, Mauro and myself, and a lot of people can be objective about this. It's not just about personal ties, it's also good business. Because a lot of those businesses in Italy, in part because of lower spending and also because this is such a huge market, really need the business in America. And we saw this in 2020, even during the worst of the COVID crisis in Italy, armaments and military material pretty much kept flowing to the US. That says a whole lot about how Italians and Italian governments value this relationship even after a few years of some America firstism and some not wholly question, helpful questions about the values of those alliances. It is a very strong relationship politically. It is supported, I think, by a very strong relationship on a military industrial level. Thank you so much, Jim. It was a really great summary of the paper um, and of the key takeaways. I heard the buzzword reshore, so we'll definitely be coming back to that later on in our discussion. And you also highlighted the critical Italian foreign investment in the United States, which is a natural segue to our CFIUS lead, Ike Blanton. 
Ike, thank you so much for joining us today from the Pentagon. Uh, given your role in the department, I was hoping that you could tell us more about the administration's approach to defense industrial policy and specifically, how is the Pentagon viewing the integration of allied industrial capabilities into the U.S. defense industrial base? Yeah, no, thank you uh, very much for the question, Leah, and thank you for the Atlanta Council for having us stay and supporting this forum and uh, you know, thank you especially to Jim for writing the paper and <laughs> the reason we're here. Uh, uh, as far as our relations and building a um, uh, our uh, industrial base with our allies and partners, uh, Secretary Austin has highlighted the importance of building and sustaining a strong workforce and unity within not just the Department of Defense, but across our nation and with our allies and partners around the world. And Italy, uh, who we're here to speak specifically about, is and will remain a part of that unity. Uh, the United States has uh, uh, has consistently and always relied upon our allies and partners for strategic and critical materials that cannot be domestically produced, even in wartime. And um, Italy has provided uh, those to us in spades throughout this relationship. And I'm really glad that uh, Jim has uh, mentioned the qualities, the, the three parts of his paper, the quality, the mutuality, and the security. I would add one more that's highlighted when you read the paper, and that is the, the length and the um, consistency with it. And uh, maybe that's uh, implied within the three cornerstones that he pointed out, but I, I think that that's uh, something to note um, because uh, this administration has uh, emphasized and come back to the importance of international cooperation and the multiplied strength that we have together uh, as allies and partners addressing common challenges. and. Um, and the recommitment to those allies and partners is evidence, and it's definitely evidence with our relationship with Italy, uh, especially with the defense industrial bases. Italy, um, Italy supplies uh, not only weapon systems and components for our aircraft, but it's also within the shipbuilding that's been mentioned, and chemicals and small arms. Uh, our supply chains with Italy are very closely connected and interlinked and uh, intertwined uh, uh, as most modern supply chains are, but the deepness and uh, uh, complexity of those supply chains with Italy are evident through many of the examples brought out in the paper. Uh, for instance, we've just heard um, from Leonardo in particular, and they are essential suppliers to multiple U.S. programs and NATO programs, including the F-35, uh, the F-35, as well as the MH-139A uh, Gray Wolf helicopter. Uh, both of those programs in particular play a very important role in advancing the strength of the United States, as well as that of our allies. Uh, protecting and transporting uh, our warfighters for uh, for these missions that are important to our national security interests. Uh, also, as uh, Jim and uh, has been pointed out uh, previously, uh, Fincantieri's uh, design won the uh, the multi-purpose frigate design and will be built in the United States in Wisconsin. And uh, it elevates that shipyard into a, a new role to be play a much more major uh, role within the defense industrial base here, but also our shared defense industrial base with our partners in Italy. And just to make sure we're not just talking about the largest of our uh, suppliers, there's uh, a lot of um, smaller uh, second, third tier suppliers that uh, that, come, that are in Italy that support our industrial base and are often the unsung heroes within the supply chain. Uh, for instance, in Italy, two key suppliers that come in mind um, are uh, Sikovit and uh, Italmach, uh, which uh, produce key chemicals and components uh, that are used uh, for defense applications. And those two suppliers supply uh, those components throughout the defense industrial base. 
So just want to emphasize and uh, uh, call upon the importance of Italy within our defense industrial base. And uh, we've talked a little bit about, uh, or at least it was mentioned, the security of supply arrangements. Uh, perhaps we can go over that a little bit later, but Italy is an exemplar nation when it comes to that, both the uh, arrangement itself, but also the code of conduct that they have with their uh, defense industrial base partners within Italy are uh, exemplary and uh, very uh, provide a very important uh, way for both of our defense departments and uh, ministries of defense to uh, use and rely upon uh, our our shared industrial base and uh, to uh, to reach out to each other to ensure the stability and resiliency of that defense industrial base. Thank you so much, Ike. That was a very useful overview, um, diving into some of the details that you're seeing every day on the uh, U.S.-Italian uh, defense cooperation. I wonder, I might turn back to Jim for, for my first moderator's privilege question. But as a reminder, everyone who is on uh, participating with us virtually today, you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom screen to drop a question um, or a comment and leave your affiliation and we can we can sort through those and I'll, I'll start posing those um, at the end of the at the end of the session. So um, Dr. Hasek, Jim, um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the the policy options for improving the US Italian relationship where you might see that it could be improved um, or at least enhancing its benefits. Um, what actions can be taken on both sides of the relationships and you know what sort of things should Ike's office, for example, be thinking of in this moment? Thanks. You know, on the Italian side, we talked some about this in the paper. On the Italian side, um, one thing that would help the United States greatly, uh, and, and by the way, the United States has a much longer way to go in catching up to what we would be recommending, what we are recommending to the Italian government. Um, the, the most favorable treatment for armaments exports in Italy is accorded to other EU member states. Um, if you, uh, if you want a, an arms export license in Italy to go to France or to Germany or to Austria, you know, um, you basically get a, a three-year pass. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to send that system, anything that has to do with that system. And this reduces a whole lot of the bureaucracy that's involved in maintaining these supply chains. Um, it would require legislation in the Italian parliament, but it would be a reasonable thing to treat the United States as such an important ally like Italy's fellow EU members, even though the United States is obviously not an EU member. Um, now, the United States would have a long way to go on, you know, when reciprocating because we have this rather labyrinthine system for arms exports, which I sometimes like to refer to not as an, as an arms control regime, but more of a bolt control regime because we, we require licenses for every little thing that goes anywhere anytime somebody wants to send it. And this doesn't exactly, you know, grease the wheels of, of, of military industrial commerce. Um, but below the level of legislation or policy, I think that Ike's office, and I, I've actually spoken with the Deputy Assistant Secretary about this, and I spoke with his predecessor about it too, um, or at least one of his predecessors about it, that um, one of the things that, that would be very helpful, um, but is very hard, is convincing the American military procurement, that is to say, you know, military acquisition bureaucracy, that we can trust some of these firms in allied countries to the same degree that we can trust American firms. Um, we have a couple of incidents, instances, as we talk about in our other paper about security of supply, where the United States government has actually got better service from folks overseas than it has gotten from firms in the United States at, at times of crisis. Um, time and time again, this is something we noted in our previous paper, uh, we've been able to rely on allies. And we've, been, we've seen very few instances in the last 20 years that we looked at, or that I looked at, uh, in which there have been problems. That message has not sunk in with the rank and file bureaucrats who, who, who deal with military procurement questions on a daily basis. And that's a bit of an education question that can maybe be dealt with through venues like the Defense Acquisition University and through policy, um, but it takes a long time. It takes a long time to affect that kind of cultural change. Affecting any sort of change in the Pentagon, but especially these uh, uh, long-standing cultural changes um, okay. is a, 
quite a challenge that I guess we can leave for Ike to, to fix after this call today. Um, I think <laughs> <You're> I'll, <laughs> I'll turn to uh, Lauren next. I think following up on um, a bit of the thread that, we, that we've seen um, throughout some of these statements already this morning, uh, as Mr. Profumo mentioned in his remarks, Europe is moving towards a more integrated defense and Ambassador Zapia addressed uh, strategic autonomy directly. So you mentioned the political challenges in Europe, but from a security standpoint, how do you view efforts in Europe to enhance their own defense and security capacity? Um, how does this impact U.S. security? Thanks, Leah. So I think it's very positive in general that European countries are looking to do more on their defense. And I think the U.S. is very supportive of this concept. The challenge, of course, is to do this in a way that is supportive of NATO and does not siphon resources away from, um, from defense efforts that we already have underway in the NATO context. Um, I think the challenge here is, is a framing question. And when we talk about European strategic autonomy, it's autonomy from what? Is it from the U.S. or is it just autonomy for Europe to be able to do more? I think it's a, a good thing, again, that we do want an aut a more autonomous and thus more capable Europe, um, but we don't want that to create unnecessary duplication or any decoupling from the transatlantic bond. And I think the Italian position on this has been very clear that they do want to build up their defense capabilities within the context of a broader European project, but they're very adamant that the transatlantic element is, um, is essential to that. And so I think that is an opportunity for the U.S. to kind of pick up on that and, and use Italy as kind of a link into some of those European defense efforts. Um, but I think overall, this is a, it's a positive momentum that, that Europe is spending more, is doing more, is looking to even increase the EU role in, in all of these defense efforts. And I think the U.S. administration has welcomed that in perhaps stronger terms than past administrations, um, which I think, again, is positive. It's just about how do we do this in a way that makes sense for all of our existing defense efforts and frameworks? Um, and, and Leah, I'm not sure if, uh, I don't wanna take away from the flow of your conversation, but um, something that I was just thinking about that kind of relates to some of the things that have been said already. I mean, Italy does have so much to, to contribute in this way. I mean, Jane, uh, Jim talked a little bit about how kind of it's already the second highest troop contributor to NATO international missions, but it has a lot of kind of specific things that it can do in this security space. Um, huge contributor to capacity building and uh, counterterrorism efforts with the, a very capable military police force, the, the Carabinieri. It's the second largest, uh, it's the largest Mediterranean Navy. Um, it has a lot of international commands. I know the ambassador mentioned in Kosovo, and also uh, it's going to take over from, from Denmark in uh, Iraq with M NMI next year, doing a lot on maritime security. And, and Italy has in the past assisted with migration and refugee efforts and supporting the Libyan Coast Guard. It has uh, Alpine troops even, like some niche capabilities that focus on, you know, kind of vertical warfare and extreme weather activities and training. Um, and Italy also has key ISR capabilities. It's arming its Reaper drones. It operates Predator drones that provide essential ISR for the alliance. So in terms of how all of this affects security cooperation in Europe, I think there are some very tangible things that Italy brings to the table that kind of um, might get overlooked in the broader kind of political context. No, that's really helpful. And I think it, it's important to look at, you know, the broader European security picture and what strategic autonomy could bring in terms of enhancing European security that thus benefits transatlantic security, but but still diving down into the niche capabilities that certain allies like Italy contribute to um, the security architecture. I, I, I think I'd like to turn it back, I think, to uh, Ike to speak a little bit from the Pentagon perspective. Um, you know, we've heard from Lauren about what, what a little bit about what Europe or and specifically Italy is doing to enhance its own cooperation um, and what, what it's bringing to the table, so to speak. But from the U.S. side, how is industrial based cooperation factoring into uh, the, the acquisition and sustainments offices international cooperation strategy to the to the extent that that exists? Um, and are things expected to change with the uh, upcoming NDS, if at all, if you can speak to that at all? Yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, 
uh, as far as the national defense strategy and any upcoming announcements go, uh, I'll leave those to the, the future and uh, to whatever uh, is is released and ends up being released. But as far as uh, acquisition and sustainment and our international cooperation and our international cooperation strategy, it comes down to, uh, as I was speaking about before, building uh, those relationships, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, the foundation with our uh, trusted allies and partners, uh, and that uh, we are uh, we continue to rely upon them and rely upon them to be key factors within our defense industrial base and our supply chain. Uh, as Lauren was pointing out, as far as uh, niche capabilities, Italy has that uh, in spades, and uh, which is one of the reasons that I was, I was speaking about before, that we'd really like to highlight the use of their, uh, their use of the security supp of supply arrangement with the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, their um, it, uh, uh, security of supply arrangements are non-legally binding uh, agreements entered into between the United States and a foreign partner uh, to provide reciprocal priorities uh, for, of support for industrial resources. Uh, uh, the SOSAs, as they're called, as we're DOD, we like our acronyms. So um, as uh, SOSAs are reciprocal, the United States can uh, request prioritization of uh, U.S. orders with our foreign suppliers, and um, our SOSA participants can request prioritization of their supply uh, of their orders with the United States and U.S. companies. Uh, U.S. has nine SOSAs in place, Australia, Canada, Finland, Italy, Norway, Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. Sorry if I don't go in alphabetical order, I'll forget <laughs> one. Um, it's better than and, I could have done. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, I've had to memorize them. Don't worry. It's, uh, you don't know, want to know what my mnemonic device is. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so uh, Italy is an exemplar use of SOSAs and their code of conduct. And uh, this goes back to uh, their, uh, a lot of the very niche uh, um, capabilities that Italy, uh, not only in their Ministry of Defense and their defense has, but also within their industrial base and their defense industrial base. Uh, the, uh, the SOSAs allow uh, the prioritization of those orders. And uh, Italy has over 60 companies that have signed up within their code of conduct uh, that uh, the United States and DOD, as well as our industrial partners, have the information to fully utilize those capabilities and oftentimes those niche capabilities with, uh, with our Italian partners. And those Italian partners have the understanding and uh, knowledge of the capabilities of the U.S. companies. Uh, going back in time a little bit, uh, it came clear in, to, that, to use an um, a, uh, a open source case, uh, the, in 2008, Italy was uh, unable to find a certain piece of, uh, of night vision equipment. Uh, and this, uh, they reached out to the United States to really start the SOSA process. The SOSA had not been in place at that time. And uh, even though the, um, the parts were, uh, oh, sorry, the, the SOSA predated that. I apologize. It was one of the first uses of the SOSA. Uh, the, uh, the parts were very scarce at that time. There was a, a lot of orders and orders were being backed up. But because uh, of the niche product uh, relationship and the uh, SOSA relationship and our foundational relationship with Italy, uh, the DOD granted the Italian request and uh, they were able to obtain the parts in a very, uh, in a relatively fast and efficient manner. It would have taken many, many more months had a SOSA not been in place. Uh, so uh, the, I, I want to stress again the importance of these types of agreements. Uh, not only do they signal the um, depth and importance of a relationship with a country and their defense industrial base, but they also serve an actual purpose in that they allow the industrial base partners to make use of the niche capabilities of each other's industrial bases. That's really helpful to see, uh, to hear from you examples of how the SOSA has enabled further cooperation between the U.S. and Italy and the uh, industrial bases. I might follow up and pull that thread a little bit more. Um, Dr. Hasek uh, wrote an earlier paper called the, the Security of Defense Trade with Allies, where he 
discusses SOSAs, but also things like um, expanding the NTIB designations. Um, to his earlier point, though, about the cultural shift within the Pentagon, uh, I, could you could you speak a little bit to how your office has been um, trying to uh, to shift this culture in the in the Pentagon and in the acquisition system, which is much larger than just the Pentagon, um, towards a more international perspective, or at least understanding the value that um, that allies can bring, and specifically utilizing uh, uh, you know SOSA agreements and, and other legislated designations to bring about further cooperation? Yeah, so I think that that question really comes back to our overall use and look at uh, the uh, our, our supply chain and the resiliency within our supply chain. And uh, while, like you, uh, <laughs> you said earlier, uh, any uh, fundamental shift in uh, in attitude is something that takes a, a long time to uh, to ensure that that paradigm is uh, is is moved. But uh, outside of that, um, uh, a key point to our supply chain resiliency is our work and dependence upon our partners, and the, our supply chains continue to grow and continue to become more global and more complex. And it's uh, the support from our allies and partners uh, that provide these key components and these niche components uh, that uh, allow for us to build even better and more productive and uh, more lethal weapon systems that support our national security interests in our Defense Department. Uh, one way that we are doing this uh, to explore the defense industrial base and the resiliency there is the launch of the, um, the new Supply Chain Resiliency Working Group. Uh, which uh, will be a two-year effort and will leverage work already being performed across the supply chain resiliency across the department and the interagency to ensure things like that you were uh, discussing as far as acquisition policy, uh, sustainment policy, and uh, looking for multiple ways to identify, mitigate, and monitor the risks within our most critical supply chains and uh, everything from semiconductors to batteries. And um, the, the working group will look at and consider um, uh, working with and integrating our allies and partners into those supply chain resiliency efforts and what we can do to promote that and what we can do to ensure the, uh, that resiliency resounds throughout our key and most important allies and partners. Thank you. That's really helpful to hear. Um, and it sounds like good progress moving forward in uh, the immovable beast of the Pentagon acquisition system. Um, I'm going to turn to Jim now, following up on the paper that you wrote that we've been talking about without involving you rudely. Uh, you published this issue brief uh, earlier this year, the security of defense trade with allies, enhancing contact contracts and control in the supply chain. And in many ways, this U.S.-Italian paper has built off of that framework articulated um, in your earlier paper, helps us better understand how allies can ensure the provision of defense goods and services in times of crisis or conflict specifically. Um, so to you, how do Buy America policies threaten America's security of supply, especially in times of crisis, like the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic? Thanks. I, I, to a certain extent, step in this because I had mentioned a paper that wasn't actually the subject of today's discussion that, you know, even, even my co-author didn't have a great deal to do with. But um, it is, it is very important, we believe, because, and, and this is what, this is why we put it up front. Uh, I, someone may have mentioned the paper about the U.S.-Italian relationship is, is intended to be just the first in a series of case studies about mm -hmm. important bilateral defense industrial relationships. But to frame that, we began with this paper about why it is that we believe we have, we have more security and supply than, than popular imagination might suggest. Um, as Ike notes, the American-Italian relationship has been very good in both ways, both ways in that, uh, in that regard. Um, it is, it is, I think I put it this way. If you can go all the way back to the First World War, okay, and realize that a significant part of the reason that the British and the French, eventually with the aid of the Americans, were able to stand up to the Central Powers and defeat them, uh, despite having 
you know, relatively smaller industrial economy than this powerhouse imperial Germany was because they could draw on supply and financial wherewithal from the rest of the planet because they were the ones who actually controlled ocean commerce. Um, the United States is in an enviable position vis-a-vis -vis its chief adversaries, China and Russia, okay? There's a very short list of allies for both those countries. It's not like a whole bunch of people are trying to sneak in there, okay? They are the ones who have the grain grain problem. It isn't we. And so it isn't so much that um, you're going to create problems as much as it is that you won't be able to take advantage of these incredible, these incredible capabilities that you see throughout the world if you don't make yourself open to global trade and even in uh, critical items such as armaments. We do control a great deal of the world's commerce here from the United States, at least on a security standpoint, we coordinate a lot of it. Uh, it is run substantially according to rules that were developed according to uh, an American-led global community. It would be very foolish to turn our backs on the 80 years of progress that we have made uh, in that respect. When we have had problems because we haven't produced everything that we wanted to produce in the United States, we have found that by and large, we've been able to import the stuff that we needed without a great delay. That's really helpful. And I, I, to your point, though, that, about that Buy America doesn't create problems per se, um, I would kind of push back on that. I think, you know, the U.S. can benefit a lot from its alliance structure. And um, I think kind of bringing it back a little bit more strategic level uh, back to Lauren, um, I would love for her to elaborate a little bit more on a report that she actually wrote here at the Atlantic Council when she had my job. Uh, she co-authored a 2019 report called More in the Med, How NATO Can Refocus Its Efforts in the South and Italy Can Lead the Charge. You know, obviously the, the U.S. has a privileged place in, in NATO. Uh, the U.S. does not strategically focus on the Mediterranean or the problems emanating from North Africa um, that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Lauren, Italy has a specific focus on and some niche capabilities that can really help tackle these these problems. So I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your report um, and kind of explain the the role that Italy has in the southern theater of the NATO Atlantic uh, NATO alliance a little bit more and then you know ultimately how that uh, helps support U.S. security specifically. Thanks, Leah, and thanks for, for highlighting the report. It really, I think, is a little bit of kind of a strategic precursor to all of this, just talking about um, mm -hmm. Italy's role in the alliance and the bilateral relationship. But um, yeah, there's a couple of points, I think, that are worth picking up on here. And this also drags in uh, one of the questions I see has come in from the audience um, from Jason Davidson on kind of the willingness of the alliance in the U.S. to actually do more on the South. So maybe I can hit a couple of these points at once. But so I think I, I've talked about kind of all of the threats in the South and why the South matters and why the U.S. should care about this. I think the trouble, um, and, and I got this when we were conducting interviews for the paper, both in Italy and other Southern allies and in the U.S., I think it's a very tricky set of issues and in the South. And I think the ask is not clear. Like, what exactly do we do to tackle those issues? And I think as we've seen with the fallout, um, in Afghanistan, and it's probably too early to truly reap uh, some of the lessons learned from this experience, but I think it's proved very tricky. And we have not necessarily gotten the approach right to tackling some of these issues. And I think because of all that, and because of you know diverging threat perceptions among different allies, because there has not been a clear solution, and because Southern allies have not necessarily managed to unite their voices and come with a clear agenda for what exactly should be done in the South, I think that has really limited the alliance's ability to kind of deliver um, on, on this geographic set of issues. And, um, you know, as a result, Italy has shouldered a lot of the burden of some of those those issues that are happening in the South. And, and as I talked a little bit about how exactly it has done that through some of the, the missions and capabilities it brings. And I think now going forward, you know, Jason was asking, you've made a case for why the U.S. should care, but but does it? And what, what are the chances of the alliance actually coming together to do something in Italy's part of the world? 
I'm, I'm, I have mixed perceptions on this. I'm, I'm optimistic for a couple of reasons. One, I think the U S is kind of intent on shifting its focus elsewhere to other parts of the world and to other issues. And so I think because of that, they have talked about the importance of relying on allies to do more in their own regions. And I think as we've talked about, they, the U S views Italy as a very close ally, a great host of U S forces and capabilities, and they're well positioned to kind of empower Italy to do more. And at the same time, Italy is also doing more itself. It has the right kind of political leadership. It's got this rare moment of national unity right now with um, this kind of interesting role it can play on, on the international stage while the Franco German kind of typical engine of Europe is maybe not on such solid footing. Um, it kind of is an, an opportunity for, for Italy to really kind of set some of the agenda in Europe. Europe and in the alliance. Um, so I think those are reasons I'm optimistic that something might actually happen. Um, I do think it's challenging just given where we are after Afghanistan. I think there's very low risk appetite, very, um, you know, kind of fatigue with this set of issues and a lack of clarity on where do we go from here. So I'm, I'm not sure we're in a position to come out with a bold, bold agenda for the South as much as I hope uh, we could do, do more on that. Um, but, but I do think going forward, it is a, an opportunity to at least set the strategic context for where do we go with the projecting stability set of activities as we reshape NATO's strategic concept. Thank you. Italy is doing so much, but there's definitely room for improvement too for, for NATO Southern allies to focus more on the Mediterranean region. So thank you so much for, for highlighting that, Lauren. Um, I agree. I think there's low appetite for some of these sort of stabilization issues for, for lack of a better phrase that encapsulates it all. But I do think there are important parts of the government here in Washington and also in, in Europe that are that are looking at these issues and are really focused in this in this post Afghanistan withdrawal moment, even as the US is strategically shifting um, more of its focus towards the Indo Pacific. I think it's an opportunity as well for for Europeans and especially those like the Italians that have, you know, the geographic uh, focus on the region as well as these niche capabilities that that, that Lauren and um, um, the, the paper that we've launched today outline. Um, so I think this has been a fascinating discussion so far, and I could certainly continue asking my own questions and abusing my moderator's privilege, but I know we have a queue of audience questions in, in the Q&A tab as well, but um, everyone feel free to keep uh, posting questions in the Q&A tab. And in the meantime, I will push it over to my colleague, uh, Stephen Grunman. Uh, Steve is the senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, where he manages the forward defense arsenals of democracy work uh, on, de on focusing on defense industry and acquisitions, including the defense industrial policy series of which today's event is a part of. Um, Steve was also a project manager for our US Italy issue brief. So Steve, over to you. You've been curating these audience questions. Uh, so please take it away. Sure. Uh, thanks, Leah. Uh, I think what I would say is, let me turn that off. Um, I think what I would say is that um, a lot of the questions are challenging uh, the panel's largely optimistic view of, of uh, particularly the prospects for this relationship, taking uh, taking for granted the, the great history of it. Uh, there's a sense in many of the questions, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to articulate them in particular, but just to create an, an overall theme of them, that, um, that the ground is changing and in a way that, that is going to challenge uh, the success of this, uh, of this partnership, uh, of this great team, uh, to, to, to quote but in English uh, crudely from the title of the paper. Um, you, uh, Lauren, um, mentioned that the question that, that Jason Davidson, who's from the University of Mary Washington, a, uh, a, a related question uh, that Jason also asked had to do with Italy's sense of its role in Europe. The AUKUS uh, uh, disruption um, has at least posed the possibility, um, uh, mostly from France, uh, that Europe itself, uh, uh, politically, militarily, and industrially, should face uh, inward, should turn more inward to toward Europe. Um, uh, uh, in, in particular, I think Jason or another uh, of the questions asks about the European about European strategic autonomy, uh, and, and I know there there is a question about um, uh, the various uh, EU organized in uh, defense industrial initiatives. So. Um, I'll leave it to you, Lee, as to where you want to direct that, but I think Jason uh, would at least like to hear Lauren on that, and maybe Jim has a thought on, uh, on the European Union's uh, defense industrial initiatives and whether they are a, a counter 
balance or some kind of a challenge to the transatlantic um, thesis that, that we have mostly been talking about here today? Yeah, I think maybe if we can turn to Lauren to start and then um, Jim to chime in, you know, we um, talked about- Leah, your microphone, I happen to notice your microphone needs to be turned on or maybe the engineer can turn it on. Uh, we heard Leah just fine, Steve. So we'll, we're, we'll turn to Lauren uh, first and then and then bump over to Jim. We talked about Buy America, now we can talk about um, the European efforts specifically to be enhancing their defense industrial base, maybe without the US. Lauren, go ahead. Thanks, Leah, and thanks, thanks to Jason for for the question. Um, so I think, as I mentioned a little bit al already, I think European defense efforts are helpful. We do want Europe to be doing more, investing more in defense. Um, it's all about frameworks and and how exactly we do it. And uh, you know, part of the pushback that I get when I talk to my European friends about this is like, you know, the U.S. tells us to do more on defense as Europe, and then they tell us, well, no, not that way. <laughs> And it creates a little bit of a schizophrenia in, in the policy. And, and I think that's something that we are now working to, to get past is swallowing some of we need to let to let Europe do more in order to achieve these things. But and a little bit of the other thing I hear a lot is, you know, duplication is not necessarily the biggest enemy in the world. We do need some some resilience and a little bit of redundancy isn't isn't the end of the world. That's natural. The EU and, and NATO work on similar issues and it's okay to have a bit of duplication between their defense efforts. And I, I hear that argument. Um, I think the trouble comes when we talk about uh, it. You need to acknowledge that the fact is there's really only one set of resources and only one set of forces. And so the trouble is a lot of times these same forces are being double hatted or even triple hatted with multiple missions and multiple sets of activities and they can't really effectively train and equip in either of them or any of them because they're simultaneously tasked with too many things and then we end up you know they're wearing an EU hat they're wearing their multi kind of coalition of the willing type uh, hats sometimes they're wearing a NATO hat as well and that really undermines our defense and deterrence posture. And so I think we can't end up in a situation where EU defense frameworks are contributing to that kind of duplication. But but I understand the, the utility of having more capable European forces and using the EU in particular, its financial and industrial base incentive capacity to have Europe do more. I'm quite encouraged by the EU Tech and Trade Council. I think there's a lot more uh, that we can do through that framework to work on some of these traditional defense industrial base issues that have plagued further cooperation um, between the EU and the US on defense. Um, and I've also just, I recently wrote a quick op-ed just kind of making the argument that I think it's time that uh, we really have to elevate the need for transatlantic tech cooperation over our competing kind of national and economic interests, because this has obviously plagued the EU-US relationship for years. And as we do that, all we do is create opportunities for Russia and China to, to win. They swoop in and they benefit from, from the divisions of the EU and the US on this. So I think helpful to kind of embrace some of the, the spirit of European defense initiatives. Um, I really think one practical thing that would be useful going forward is having some kind of strategic, uh, some shared definition of what strategic autonomy means. Um, and so hopefully that can come as a combination of efforts through NATO strategic concept development, as well as EU strategic compass. Um, if we can have some kind of shared definition of what that really means so that we don't have to, to talk past each other, uh, when we're when we're talking about our ambitions going forward, I think that would be really helpful. Thanks. I think that's really helpful. You pointed out the the concept and and the compass, but as well for I think the first time ever, we also have the U.S. National Defense Strategy and National Security Strategy be developed at the same time as both of these framing documents. So um, I think it's a it's a right moment. So over to uh, Dr. Hasek to to answer the rest of the the audience questions that Stephen highlighted. Okay, so just for, uh, for reference, I'm talking about the question of the European Union's enthusiasm now for funding its own technological development, military industrial efforts at home. Okay, um, I'm going to switch from my not very good high school Italian to my not very good high school French. I'm going to say that for a very long time in Europe, there was a notion of what they called the juste couture to uh, military spending, right? And if we're going to get involved in some international cooperative development program, then 
We want to see some of the money flow here. Okay. Oh, heck, what do we think that Buy America is about? Okay. So there's probably not a whole lot of ability for Americans to tell Europeans that, hey, you should spend some of your money over here. Okay. Um, now, it would be economically efficient, ceteris paribus, okay, if we had one big, happy transatlantic military industrial community without trade barriers. However, there are sometimes when you carve off these individual world gardens, there, there can be some sort of second order benefits. And I'm going to try to make it real in a very non think tank way and to provide a very practical example that gets back to an Italian thing, which is the frigate. A couple of years ago at a trade show, when Fincantieri was just bidding their frame frigate uh, to the US Navy, they were proposing. Um, I heard a story from one of the, one of the um, uh, marketing guys. They'd spent a lot of time studying marketing to the armed forces. It's one of the things I do as an academic. And he said, you know, um, for the Italian ship, uh, outside the damage change roll lockers, from where you would repair if you had a shipboard fire, a flooding incident, you know, uh, where people would assemble, where damage control teams would assemble before they went into the fire or the flooding while they were waiting. We had these fold down seats that came out of the bulkhead. It was really clever design to say you wouldn't see them until you walked up to them and they folded them down. And the US Navy folks told them, no, we don't have a requirement for those. Get rid of them. Like, get rid of them. All the Americans who tried them out said, these are awesome. Now, he said, we're going to hope to get this back into the design later. This is not something, though, however, that you get out of American out of American military minds for some reason. Okay, and there are lots of things like this where there are particular technologies that are developed in Europe, particular systems, subsystems, even like little design elements that are very clever. You see it in Italy, you see it in Sweden, you see it in the Czech Republic. Some of the countries with smaller military industrial efforts, military industrial bases, where they do very clever things that maybe for some reason don't occur to us over here. So I'm really not too worked up about the possibility that some money would be kept in Europe amongst Europeans for doing European things that might ultimately flow back here. That might, that might just work out. Do we have more questions? We do. Uh, Leah, may I, may I continue? Yes, Steve, please. Okay. Um, uh, similar kind of glass half empty, uh, let's say, themed questions come from... Uh, the council's great friend, Vago Maradian, the founder and editor of the Defense Aer and Aerospace Report, as, whether, as well as Heather Macera, both of whom would like the panel, particularly Ike, uh, if you would, to come back to the question of whether or not the administration's ostensible and, and public enthusiasm for Buy America uh, is not really a, a changed landscape for the kind of defense industrial cooperation that, that, that we've mostly talked about. Um, here and that has been so successful. Um, I think in particular, you know, each of them, uh, uh, Vago and Heather, has a version of this question. Heather in particular cites in the current uh, De National Defense Authorization Act that I think is being debated on the Hill for fiscal year 22, uh, there is a section of, of that law in particular, which uh, in her words, more steeply increases, more steeply still, is going to increase the domestic requirements for future DOD procurements. So I know we have talked about that, but these two questions would like uh, ask the panel to come back on that again um, and, and ask in particular, uh, Ike, if you would, um, is the audience hearing uh, the administration's enthusiasm for Buy America wrong, or is that not truly a changed landscape for uh, the possibilities of U.S. Italian cooperation? I, uh, so thanks for the question, and I, I'm not sure it's either. And as far as the current NDAA goes, we know that these things go through many iterations. So uh, and uh, and tend to to change as uh, the our Congress gets together and decides what to put into the final version. So I'd rather not comment necessarily on uh, the current status uh, until. It, it comes out, but the the recent Armed Services uh, House Armed Services Committee on uh, the Defense uh, Critical Supply Chain uh, Task Force uh, recommended a balanced approach to assessing foreign dependencies, accounting for the multiple goals of uh, th that include strengthening alliances, promoting interoperability with allies and partners, and um, buying in America and buying allied whenever possible. So that was the um, what came out of that, and the Department of Defense recognizes that uh, blanket uh, domestic uh, sourcing requirements 
uh, uh, risk causing economic damage to the defense industrial, industrial base, as well as impairing and uh, having a significant impact on U.S. foreign policy and defense cooperation issues. Uh, DOD is generally supportive of uh, these efforts, uh, it, but at the same time, continues to highlight uh, the need for engagement uh, and the need for uh, engagement and uh, uh, interaction with the, the overall global marketplace. So I would I would just simply say that it is a balancing issue and uh, and one that uh, continues to be at the forefront not only of the U.S. political landscape but at the global political landscape, as our allies and partners often uh, tend to to look at these things in a similar light for their own uh, economies and defense industrial bases. I would take a step back for an Italy specific approach though and say that Italy is one of 27. Uh, qualifying countries that have a reciprocal procurement of memorandum of understanding with the United States, which uh, does waive certain parts of certain uh, of certain Buy America statutes. Um, and these uh, legal agreements are signed by the Secretary of Defense, are publicly available, and uh, do currently remain in effect. Okay, let me let me go on. Um, there's a good, uh, interesting question here from Mark Provedera. Uh, that essentially is asking at the t at the high technology development at the level of uh, industrial capability that involves really high technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, um, advanced developments for the space force. It, are are those uh, needs uh, of 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 the U.S. military? Are those suitable uh, opportunities uh, platforms for cooperation between the U.S. and Italy uh, as well? as, uh, you know, airplanes and uh, platforms uh, that, that, that more, more famously uh, occupy the U.S. and Italian uh, defense industrial partnership. High technology. Jim, I, I happen to know you have written on the, on the utility of, of thinking about uh, international cooperation as much or maybe more around technology complementarities as uh, platform and production complementarities. Maybe you'd be a good one to start on this. Well, thanks, Steve. That's mostly because I once wrote a paper with you about it. But, um, <laughs> uh, and the point of that, uh, for everybody else, was that um, because we do see these, these interesting ideas uh, coming out of all sorts of different places around the world, we, we might make the general observation that for a long time, and somebody's got to fight for it, somebody's got to fight about this, probably more than one, but for a long time, globalization was about in, an increasing flow of goods from place to place. And more recently, it's been uh, to a greater degree about an increasing flow of ideas from place to place. And so if we worry to a certain extent, and I think it's a bit overblown, about a security of supply with domestic manufacturing, and if certain folks politically worry about even though it is economically inefficient generally about, you know, protecting jobs and, and, and sourcing things locally, uh, maybe for other reasons, um, then there might be a certain efficiency to uh, internationalizing design and localizing to a certain extent production. Okay. So I think that's something that's really worth exploring. On uh, Mark Provedera's uh, question in particular, which I can also see here, um, I can say that I'm, I'm less than an expert on software and certainly on artificial intelligence, but I know a bit about the space stuff. And that is that Italy has a very capable um, space industry and going back for a long time, the ambassador herself uh, you know, mentioned that cooperation between the U.S. and Italy in space began in the 1960s. Um, and so, and, and, and indeed, Italy has recently stood up within its Air Force some uh, uh, military uh, space capabilities, uh, I mean, specifically a space center. And so um, that is very logical. Uh, it, it's already underway and we're going to see more of it, certainly. Lauren, I think you have also done some work more recently even on uh, transatlantic technology cooperation. Do you have a view on uh, uh, Mark Provider, Marco Provedera's question? Thanks, Steve. Uh, I think it's a really good question. And um I think my broader take on this 
on TransLink tech, tech cooperation is that we should be, as allies and partners, thinking less and less about kind of all of these very specific proliferating platforms and moving towards kind of big investment bets on this system of systems approach, you know, and so thinking much more about what are the key technologies that we need to invest in jointly and how do we make it easier to kind of sign things like R&D agreements and to get in on some of these cooperation initiatives earlier from the start so that we kind of have that interoperability and joint investment baked in from the start. Um, and others on, on the panel can speak much more uh, eloquently than I can on all of the, the technical um, and legal challenges and hurdles to doing that. But, you know, we've been doing a lot of advocating for trying to to bring allies in more earlier on and also bringing in industry more earlier on and um, specifically kind of, and I think this is one of the other themes that I'm seeing come in in the questions is not just large kind of established defense firms that um, are already quite familiar with government contracting in this space, but when we're talking about new innovative capabilities like artificial intelligence and things like that, trying to find better ways to engage smaller companies where a lot of radical innovation is taking place, but they don't have a ton of capacity to uh, to scout out government opportunities, don't know how to navigate the bureaucracy, don't have the capacity for these long-term project uh, timelines. Um, so trying to speed all of that up, trying to engage non-traditional industry partners um, to try and enhance our cooperation on these some of the, the broader technologies that, that Mark mentioned, like AI, and especially as we start to move towards this JADC2 model, joint all-domain um, command control, I think that's that's the direction we need to go um, and not just focus on some of these individual platform cooperation. Great, Ashley, you've alluded to the very last question that I want to get in and I'll ask Ike to just give us a one minute answer to it is from Charles um, Musier, uh, who uh, either owns or represents a small and disadvantaged veteran owned business asking in so many words, how do we get in on this defense uh, supply trade uh, this this uh, allied this trade with allies between the U.S. and Italy are there opportunities? I, I think in particular he's wondering to to sell into Italy from the United States or for that matter to be part to become a partner with an Italian firm that's participating in the U.S. market. What advice? I know that the small uh, business uh, uh, affairs of the Pentagon are within the uh, scope of your office. Ike, maybe you could give him a one minute answer on that for now. Or at least how no, perhaps think, he could follow up with uh, your office. There's probably a portal somewhere. That, that was going to be my general advice, uh, is please follow up with our office. I'm happy to direct you to the, the website or to provide uh, uh, email information for the specific, specific people to get in touch with. Uh, more specifically, the Department of Defense has made um, – uh, significant efforts to bring in uh, through the Office of Small Business to bring in these types of small businesses. So I'm glad that he highlighted it because they are an important part of our defense industrial base of our economy and uh, represent a significant amount of the uh, of the innovation and of the hard work going on throughout the United States on these issues. So uh, bringing bringing him in, I'm happy to uh, to uh, to email him or get in touch with him or get him in touch with the right portal to to make that happen. Okay, thank you, Leah. Yes, thank you so much to our panelists, uh, especially to to Ike and Lauren and Jim for taking part in this panel discussion. Uh, and on behalf of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here at the Atlantic Council, I will now turn it over to. Steve to give us some last final updates on, on what else his office is, is working on. And, and thank you so much again for, for joining us for this event on U.S.-Italian defense cooperation. Thank you so much, Leah. I, uh, before offering my coming attractions of the arsenals of democracy project that I run, I do want to go back to the top of the agenda and, and, and wholeheartedly and on behalf of the Scowcroft Center, thank again General Scaparotti, uh, Alessandro Profumo and Bill Lynn from Leonardo. Uh, and Ambassador Zappia uh, for uh, each of their uh, remarks and anticipation and support of, of the council remarks in this event, but but uh, support of the council uh, over a long period of time. Uh, thanks to all of them and and indeed to to the panel and to my my colleague Leah. Thanks very much, Leah. Yeah, the coming attraction that I most especially wanted to call out is three weeks from today. Uh, the 28th of October, Thursday morning, the 28th at 1130. Uh, one of the other series uh, in a, alongside this defense industrial policy series that I run is called Captains of Industry. And this is a series where 
Uh, we bring chief executives typically or very senior executives of companies in the aerospace and defense sector to come and talk about in the mission statement of the series, the public policies their companies, uh, excuse me, the public interests their, uh, their companies serve and the public policies that shape their market. Well, on the uh, 28th of October, Wes Kramer, who is the president of the missiles and defense business of Raytheon Technologies, will be here uh, for some remarks and a conversation with me in that cap of industry series. Those of you who are interested in defense industrial policy and defense industry in general, um, I hope you'll come back and look for our invitation to that event on the 28th of October. Um, I think that should do it. We're just a minute into extra time, so let's, let's put a wrap on it uh, right there. This has been a great discussion, serves all of the purposes that I certainly have for the defense industrial policy series, and uh, we will look forward to having as many of you as we can at another event in this series in the future. Thank you. 